this man came up to me in an alley in 1987 and, and he asked me what my name was. And I was afraid to tell him because my name is very hard to pronounce and growing up a lot of people made fun of it. Uh, but when I told him, he said, that's a fine Italian name, you should be very proud of that. And being an Italian American kid, my parents from Italy, that's really all I knew. Uh, and then he said, somebody wants to take that away from you. They want to destroy that pride. Um, and I still didn't understand, but he was the first person to offer me a sense of identity, community, and purpose. And I had never experienced that before. It was very seductive for me to be, you know, to go from this powerless position to something of power. Can you explain to me what mechanisms played at that time, what factors were crucial in, in, in that radicalization process? Uh, you know, my family really kind of had a normal American story. They're Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the mid-60s uh, and were good parents. They loved me a lot, uh, but also had to work seven days a week, 16 hours a day. Um, and I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I belonged or, or even what my purpose in life was. And So you felt lack of identity, lack of purpose, um, did school uh, enhance that feeling? Were you feeling lonely, abandoned yeah. there as well? Did you miss community feeling there as well? Yeah. On the south side of Chicago, where my family was from, uh, they moved us out of the Italian neighborhood to a suburb that was very white, not ethnic at all. Uh, so I was suddenly an outsider in that community, and that's where I went to school. So every day I would go to school and I would get picked up after school, after being bullied, and taken back to the Italian neighborhood. But the, the kids there didn't accept me either because I was from a different neighborhood. So I was, you know, I didn't have any friends. I was bullied. I was, uh, you know, this short, shy kid who, you know, was easy to pick on. Mm -hmm. And it was easy to seduce me with that promise of paradise, of power, of importance. And was there anyone who reacted? Did they stand up against you? Did they go along with you? Were they afraid of you? What, what was their reaction? The bullies that had bullied me for 14 years now avoided me. Okay. Uh, and then I recruited them. So it went from this position of, of total powerlessness to this perception of power almost overnight. What about teachers? Hmm. They must have noticed that you were you know, crying for attention almost, or did they not see it that way? No, I think that they saw it more as, as they needed to punish me for what I was doing, mm -hmm. uh, rather than to ask me what was wrong. I was, you know, constantly starting fights or or saying really, uh, you know, obnoxious things or recruiting people. You know, I was I was making uh, life at school very difficult for the mm -hmm. administrators. They, I think, saw me as a problem that they wanted to eliminate, push away. Which they did because which you, they did. I went to six high schools, mm -hmm. kicked out of all of them. I, you know, I don't, I don't know, but I think that earlier on, had somebody offered me an option, something different, I would have taken it. It just didn't what, happen. What, what option do you think a teacher could have offered you like that? What, what would have been? Well, I think I could have started by listening, okay. not to my ideology, but to what I was saying without using words, mm -hmm. uh, because I was crying for help. Uh, everything that I did, looking back now, was uh, to try and get attention because I felt like nobody had seen me. You know, one of, the, one of the issues that I'm seeing is that these ideas, this pre-radicalization happens early, not ideologically, mm -hmm. but the openness to accept extreme behavior, the openness to be violent or criminal or to be misogynistic, that is all rooted in experiences that we've had growing up as children. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's really about creating a place where Everybody has a sense of agency. Everybody can feel like they're contributing something mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's that marginalization, it's the alienation, I think, that causes people to look for acceptance in really negative places. Okay, but how, as a teacher, how can you notice that there is this one pupil in your class who is really being manipulated, who is being susceptible to mm -hmm. a certain ideology? How can you pick up that signal? Well, I think we look for the same things that we would look for for anything else, drugs or gangs or, or depression or suicide. It's, it is about you know, behaviors changing very quickly. It's about language being adopted that you know, normally they wouldn't use or changing in friends or, or, or dropping all the things that make them happy, like their hobbies, their family. Because if you think about it, being a neo-Nazi, joining ISIL, suicide, uh, uh, you know, crime, prostitution, those are all 
those are all expressions of extremism. Yeah. You know, I was broken I, and I tried to find my identity, community, and purpose in toxic ways. Uh, I could have easily joined a gang. I could have easily become a drug addict or committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Those were all my, could have been manifestations of, of my own extremism, except I chose to project my own self-hatred onto other people to numb me like a drug. Okay. Um, and, you know, that is, uh, I think that that is, if once we recognize that, once we recognize that this isn't an ideological battle, that this is really about repairing the foundation for people from the day they're born. It's what you do all the time, you know, talking to people to try to disengage them from their ideology. And listen. Uh, and listen. I do a lot of listening. Is that what you would recommend to teachers as a first yeah. step? Start listening? Yeah, but listen for the things that words can't say. Understand that everything we do is based on a motivation that we really don't talk about usually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, so much of why I was radicalized was because I wanted my parents' attention. I wanted them to see me. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they did see me, finally, and they were horrified by what I was doing, I amplified it because then I knew it was working, that I was mm -hmm. getting back at them, making them angry. Are you saying it's, it's a collective responsibility? Or? Absolutely. We all have the tools. And the, the answer is you don't once have to discuss the ideology to disengage somebody. You have to fix the broken human. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? What we need to do is start making sure that we treat every single person from the day they're born so that they're, they don't feel like a piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. okay. What would be your, uh, your one big message for teachers and schools towards mm -hmm. young people? Find somebody that you don't think deserves your compassion and give it to them and watch what happens because I guarantee you they're the ones who can benefit the most from it.